All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the virtual learning course, Six Things You Need to Know About Bicycle and Pedestrian Accommodations in Virginia. My name is Sarah Snavely, and I will be moderating today's session. This session will be provided via both audio and web conference. Um, this, this program will also last approximately 60 minutes, including a Q&A session. If you have a question at any point in time during today's presentation, you may submit it via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please note that we will be sending all attendees certificates of completion via email for PDH self-reporting credit purposes. We have a couple great speakers for you today, inc including Nick Susi, Kyle Riblett, Ben Doran, Andrew Smith, Brian Wright, and Thomas Ruff from Timmins Group. Today, we are going to look at different bike and pedestrian accommodations in Virginia. This seminar will provide an overview of current ADA, AASHTO, and VDOT requirements, as well as a number of real world examples, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today, Nick Susi. Nick, take it away. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Hopefully, the start of your week is going well. Um, we're gonna dive right in here. Uh, as we, as Sarah mentioned, this presentation is focused primarily on uh, bike and pet accommodations uh, in public facilities uh, in the state of Virginia. So without further ado, uh, my name is Nick Susie. I'm in our transportation group. Uh, I'm joined today by Brian Wright, who is in our structure and bridge design group, Ben Duran and Kyle Riblet, who are in our transportation design group as well. Thomas Ruff is in our traffic analysis and planning group, and Andrew Smith uh, in our transportation design group also with a focus on signals. Um, all of our contact info will be on the last slide of the presentation as we're doing Q&A if you need it. So what are we going to cover today? Um, as the title alludes to six, six main topics here, the first being navigating design criteria, uh, multimodal bridge considerations, practical design of curb ramps, designing the right crossing, signalization, repurposing existing right-of-way, and then we'll wrap up, uh, make a few key points, and then address any questions and provide answers to those that we might get. Again, as Sarah mentioned, feel free to use the chat option to submit your questions as we go through. So diving right in here um, to navigating design criteria, the, the first thing that we're going to want to look at uh, is really, again, with a focus on public facilities in Virginia, what are our primary design resources? Where do we find those design guidelines and, and requirements? Who are the primary ones you see here? Uh, the VDOT Road Design Manual, a lot of great information in that, as well as the AASHTO Guide for Bike Facilities. That's not the AASHTO Green Book. It is a, an AASHTO bicycle specific publication uh, which is, is also very useful. A couple of others, uh, the PROWAG Public Right-of-Way Accessibility Guidelines uh, which we'll hit on in, in good detail later. ADA requirements always, VDOT Manual of the Structures and Bridge Division, the AASHTO Green Book, as well as keep in mind any locality requirements you may have or design uh, manuals that, that any locality may have. So those are the primary ones. That's not to say there aren't others. There certainly are, uh, but these are, are some of the primary resources for, for working through your design criteria. So anytime you're, you're looking to start a project, even before you start a project, if you're, you're thinking about a funding application or, or a future project, long-term planning, you want to establish your goals. Uh, once you have those goals, you can really then talk about the design criteria. Uh, there's a ton of terms up here on the screen, uh, many different design options, and each one of those terms comes with a very specific set of design criteria. For that purpose, terminology is key. I can't say that enough. Um, that terminology will set your design requirements before your project even begins. So you want to make sure you're using the correct terminology. We'll get into some of that here in, in a bit. Um, so. As we're looking to establish the project goals, we want to take a step back and, and think, who are our users going to be for these facilities that we're considering? 
Um, we'll dive into that again a bit more here shortly. What are the goals for the facility? You know, how are we going to move people? Is it on road? Is it off the road? That sort of thing, uh, as well as any constraints you might have, whether it's budgetary, right of way, utilities, things like that. Those are your typical constraints. Um, and all of that kind of goes together to set your design expectations. And again, using that correct terminology, you're really setting those, those expectations early. So with that, I think it's important, the first bullet there is users. Uh, let's dive into that a bit more. It may sound simple, um, but as you start getting into design criteria, it's actually very important that you establish who your users are going to be. Uh, it's really fundamental to the success of your project. You know, if, if you envision a, a sidewalk that might only be used by pedestrians uh, and, and overlook some kind of bicycle generating uh, destination and next thing you know you've got bikes driving up and down a five-foot sidewalk well that's not going to be a very uh, pleasure pleasurable uh, experience for your your pedestrians that you were aiming to serve initially so there are common users again bikes uh, people walking but there's also some uncommon users that, that we have to keep in mind now whether it's motorized scooters skateboards even horses in some situations, but take it a step further to, to keep in mind, are you designing for uh, families, young children, uh, or is it more geared towards the professional cyclists who might be using the facility? Um, another, another thing to, to consider is to look at the locality's comprehensive plan or a bike and pedestrian plan if there is one. A lot of that will give good information on, on who the expected users might be or intended users might be. Again, if you're on, let's say, a state bike route or a locality's bike route, you're going to want to be focused on ensuring that continuous bicycle facility is provided. So once you establish who those primary users are, are going to be, um, you can really move into selecting what type of accommodations you're going to provide. Doing that, this is a step where you really define the interactions between each of those users. Um, whether you have a pedestrian only facility, a bicycle only facility, or multiple uses within one facility, um, the type of accommodation you're providing is, as I mentioned, exactly how those people are gonna interact, how they're passing each other, if there's enough room for them on the facility. Typical ones, obviously, for pedestrian use, your sidewalks and trails. Again, very different design requirements. Bicycle use, there's several examples here. The bottom left picture there, uh, you'll see a bike lane and, and I'll just kind of hit on that. You know, there's a bike lane, but there's also different classifications of bike lanes, each with their own design criteria. So the simple bike lane that you see here or more traditional. Uh, there's also buffered bike lanes, which we'll see some examples of later. And there's separated bike lanes or also known as cycle tracks, which are completely removed. Uh, not along the edge of the road as you see here. So, um, you know, just using a generic term like bike lane, make sure we're, we're getting into specifics as to which design criteria we're using. One note that I will make, the VDOT road design manual, which I mentioned earlier, Appendix A1, uh, within the section on bike and pedestrian improvements, there's a great guide on selecting treatments to accommodate bicycles, uh, both on and off road. A great resource to look at and certainly are, we're happy to, to walk anyone through that if we need to. Um, the last bullet here, multiple use, uh, there's certainly to me seems like the most confusion happens around this, this group of facilities, uh, whether it's shared use paths, trails, uh, you may hear people refer to multi-use trails, um, thinking that it's a shared use path, there, there tends to be some confusion there. Um, again, knowing that terminology is critical. Uh, for that reason, I will dive a little bit deeper here into the design criteria for a shared use path. This is not a multi-uses trail. Uh, this is not a trail. This is a shared use path. And the first thing you'll notice when you start looking at design criteria is that the different design resources are going to have different criteria. Now, this is just VDOT and ASHTO. Again, there may be local or other uh, guidelines for the facility. Uh, certainly, you know, with sidewalks or bike lanes, something different, you're going to see a different set of criteria. But 
first thing you want to look at minimum path width for shared use path. VDOT generally, the minimum suggested width is 10 feet, whereas AASHTO uh, allows for eight feet. Now in the VDOT system, you can, you can go down to eight uh, through the design waiver process, but this is just to point out that the different resources do have different classifications, different dimensions. You want to look to leverage those where, where practical to, to make a difference for your facility. The same goes for the second row from the bottom there, the buffer width adjacent to the roadway. So what is the separation you need from the edge of your travel lane to the shared use path? VDOT, a higher number here with eight feet from the face of curb, whereas AASHTO, again, lists a smaller number at five feet. So another example of an opportunity uh, to minimize, let's say, your, your footprint a bit. If you have a tight right-of-way or some utilities you're trying to avoid, you know, the, the design resources that are out there are all great tools to utilize to try to, to get the most bang for your buck, if you will, in terms of the accommodations you can provide. Uh, my goal here is not to go through all the, the design criteria or design resources, but just to make the point that, you know, terminology is key, knowing those differences is key, um, and then working through those resources that, that we mentioned, as well as the others that are out there, really can, can help you build a successful project. So we'll dive into a bit more of this uh, with Brian. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Uh, my name is Brian Wright. I work in our structures division here at Simmons Group. Uh, wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, once you've set up, set up your uh, design criteria, um, you're designing your path and you run into a bridge crossing uh, and some of the issues you might want to consider um, when thinking about that. Uh, oftentimes bridges, I know, can be uh, one of the most expensive parts of a project on a per square foot basis. So definitely want to make sure we're being as efficient as we can. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about uh, simply just pedestrian or, and bicycle bridges uh, on their own, not attached to any uh, vehicular bridge. Uh, so here you see we've got standard pedestrian bridge. Um, the minimum clear width of eight feet, that is a VDOT requirement. Obviously that can be adjusted depending on your need. If you've got a, uh, a, a nature trail that's got fairly low traffic volume, you can definitely go a little narrower than that. Um, but the point I want to make about an eight foot width being a good desirable width is that if you start dealing with a prefabricated truss like you see here and you deal with uh, any kind of longer span length, um, oftentimes you, you're going to be fixed into that eight foot width just from a global stability um, perspective of that truss member. Uh, those structures can become unstable if they get too narrow. Uh, I also mentioned the uh, minimum overhead clearances. Uh, so if you just have pedestrians, you need to provide at least eight feet of overhead clearance. Obviously, we don't want anybody hitting their heads. And if you need any maintenance vehicles or anything to access the bridge, you need a 10-foot vertical clearance. For pedestrian and bicycle bridges, so we're thinking shared use paths, shared use trails, something like that. Um, again, I'm pulling these numbers right out of uh, what VDOT requires and ASHTO requires. Um, it could vary. Uh, so for VDOT, um, you need a minimum eight-foot shared use path width. Uh, but a preferred width being 10 feet. Uh, the biggest point I want to um, make here is that you need to include your shoulders on your bridge width. So a common um, mistake you might see in a preliminary draft of a shared use path bridge is the shared use path is eight feet, so the bridge is eight feet curb to curb. We need to accommodate those shoulders as well on our shared use path bridges. So don't forget your two feet shoulders on either side. And then if your pedestrian bridge is crossing over a highway, the minimum vertical clearance over that roadway is 17 feet, six inches. And the reason I make a point to say this is those that are familiar uh, with roadway bridge design guidelines, at least here in Virginia, it's a uh, 16 foot, six inch minimum vertical clearance. Um, for pedestrian bridges, that's up to 17 feet, six inches. And I think that point's made all too clear by this picture. This is a pedestrian bridge that was in Detroit, Michigan. It was hit by an underpassing truck and you can see the results there. Uh, vehicular bridges oftentimes have four or five or more girders. They're really robust, bust. they're really stiff structures. These pedestrian bridges, being that they're narrower, um, are oftentimes uh, a little less robust and more susceptible to failures like this um, with a vehicular collision. So we just wanna give that extra foot a free board to kind of cover ourselves. Uh, and then the overwhelming point I wanna make during this presentation is that um, bridges and structures like this, they're not 
cheap and they're certainly not cheap to come back and modify in the future. So we always want to be thinking about current and future potential users of our bridge. Uh, so I showed here a pedestrian bridge. I'm not sure um, exactly where this pedestrian bridge is or where it attaches to. I just think it shows a good example. Um, and maybe it's perfectly appropriate for where it's at. But you can imagine if this was an area that was traversed by a lot of bicyclists or there were ADA requirements that needed to be considered on either side of this bridge, this is definitely not an ideal solution. Um, and it's something that might be more expensive in the long run to fix later on than to fix during construction. Um, right, now we're going to start talking about accommodating uh, pedestrian and bicycle facilities on roadway bridges. And again, similar to the last picture, we're kind of thinking about current and future use. Uh, this is a bridge that is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, it has since been replaced with a bridge that has sidewalk on it. But uh, I think this picture is pretty ironic. You see this young lady here walking, um, got a binder in her hand, could be going to school, could be going to work, who knows. But there's a sidewalk clearly behind her. And as you get to the bridge, you just have this three, maybe four foot, if we're lucky, wide safety sidewalk. That's certainly not safe really for pedestrians to be walking on. It was never intended to have high pedestrian volume. Uh, the history of this area is that a lot of development came up over the years after, well after this bridge was built. Uh, but I think it's a good case study to remind ourselves to keep in mind uh, not only current uses of the bridge, but future uses as well. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the geometry on bridges uh, when we're trying to accommodate pedestrian and bike traffic. First we're gonna th thing we're gonna talk about is when, are you, when you need railing and when you don't. So here in the state of Virginia, barriers are required when you have design speeds greater than 45 miles an hour. So if you're dealing with a VDOT project, you have design speeds greater than 45 miles an hour, you need a barrier, there's really no arguments there. Other states vary. I've seen um, some states where it's a 40 mile an hour limit, some, they don't have any limit listed at all. It's just a decision that needs to be discussed during scoping and made early on in the design process. So let's just say we have a simple case where we have a sidewalk on our bridge. Uh, if we need a barrier, so our design speeds are greater than 45 miles an hour, or we just decide to put a barrier on for other reasons, and we'll discuss a little later on maybe why you might think to do that. Um, if you do have a barrier, you need a seven foot wide sidewalk. So that distance is basically your clear width. So your curb to curb sidewalk width, if you will. If you don't have a barrier, you only need a six foot width. Uh, but the one thing I want to point out there is that's from the back face of curb to the rail. And you can see in this uh, diagram below, which is taken from the VDOT structure and bridge manual, um, you see that six inch minimum highlighted uh, indicating the thickness of the face of sidewalk curb. Uh, it's just a key thing to remember when you're laying out your bridges if you have sidewalk on there, to don't forget that six inch uh, kind of fillet required on the edge of your sidewalk curbs. Uh, that's an easy thing to miss. If you have two sidewalks, one on either side of the bridge, that could be a foot of width that you're missing that you're gonna need to go back and add later. Um, I also wanted to quickly talk about bicycles on bridges. Uh, so if we're just trying to act, uh, provide a bicycle path on the bridge, uh, you can see two sketches here. Again, these are VDOT sketches showing um, the bike lane width you need to provide both with and without a sidewalk. Um, and just know that those are in the VDOT structure and bridge manual. There's a couple other examples depending on the exact layout of your bridge, um, but I don't want to go into to, to all the exact requirements. Um, but I did want to point out something um, on this next slide, just to keep in mind the details we're dealing with here. This is the Huguenot Bridge in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, this is a very popular bridge for bicyclists to traverse. Um, it's a relatively new bridge. It's a beautiful structure. Uh, engineers did a great job. The contractors did a great job. Um, it's a gorgeous bridge to look at. It's a very scenic part um, of the Richmond area. And you can see here they provided really good geometric considerations. There's a sidewalk. There's, a, there's plenty of room on the shoulder for bikes to use. But I really want to draw your attention to that little drain you can see there. Um, what happened was when they built the bridge, they designed these drains. And the grates on these drains were in the longitudinal direction of the bridge. And very soon after this bridge opened, uh, there was news stories coming out about bicyclists complaining about those grates being dangerous because their tires could easily get stuck in the grates, causing them to flip over the front of their handlebars. Now, as far as I know, nobody, this never happened to anybody, but there was definitely a concern. Um, so it was a big news story. Uh, to VDOT's credit, um, they went out, they changed them immediately. Um, they were very responsive to those concerns. 
Uh, but it just shows that we can have these huge bridge projects. There was a lot of time and effort that went into this bridge and the designers did a great job with it. But one little detail that can be so easily overlooked can be what the new story is after a bridge is constructed. Um, so I thought this was just a good case study on sort of, we got to remember the little things as well. Uh, here we have a shared use path on a vehicular bridge. This is the Capitol Trail down towards Williamsburg, Virginia, where it crosses Chickamauga Creek. This is just a really great example of what a shared use path on a vehicular bridge looks like when you've got a barrier on either side. Um, quickly talking about the geometric requirements here. They're the same as for the shared use path only bridge we talked about earlier. You need to include your shared use path width of eight feet or 10 feet plus a two foot shoulder on either side if you're using a barrier. Um, if you're not using a barrier, uh, putting a shared use path on a bridge, the geometrics get a little bit more involved. Um, and I wanted to take a second to point this out. You see the dimensions there at top of 12 feet or 10 feet. Um, again, that's your typical shared use path with 10 feet plus a two foot shoulder. But then you see this five foot six inch minimum from the face of curb to sort of the inside of your shared use path lane. That is a requirement on all shared use paths that do not have a barrier involved. So remember what I said earlier, even if you have a design speed less than 45 miles an hour, you may want to at least preliminarily consider putting a barrier on. Uh, so for this case here, if you put a barrier on there, you'd still need your two foot shoulder plus about a one foot barrier. So you'd have about three feet there from your edge of shared use path to the edge of travel way, where in this case you have five foot six. So by not putting a barrier on a bridge in this case, you're actually adding about two and a half feet of width to your structure. Maybe that's something you want, maybe that's something you want to avoid, but it's just something I wanted to bring up about that five foot six minimum offset from face of curb when you have a shared use path without a barrier. And finally, to wrap all of this up, uh, I just kind of wanted to bring it back to making sure we're thinking about our current future users. Again, bridges are oftentimes the most expensive item per square foot. We want to be thoughtful about how much space we're using. Uh, but we also want to realize that adding facilities in the future is going to be more expensive than accommodating them in the, in, in the current project. Um, so one more example, this is the Nickel Bridge in Richmond, Virginia. Um, there is a park on the north side of this bridge. On the south side of this bridge, there is a popular bicycle route. And as you can see here, uh, it's used by both pedestrians, bicyclists, a ton of people use this bridge. Uh, it, it's an older bridge. It was built quite a while ago. It has been modified to the city of Richmond's credit. They've done um, projects to try and improve pedestrian and bicycle use of this bridge, but it's still a very tight, narrow walkway. Uh, I'm sure whenever this bridge was designed, people weren't considering pedestrian and bicycle traffic is their first and foremost thought. But today it's a very popular avenue for pedestrians and bikes. Uh, so again, I just think this picture does a great job of reiterating the point that we wanna be thinking about both current and future uses of pedestrian and bike traffic when we're designing our bridges. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kyle Rublé. Thank you, Brian. So. I will be focusing on the practical design of programs and not necessarily getting into all the standards, but just really looking at common mistakes and things you want to pay attention to. So this part of the presentation is the design of programs, also known as maintaining the pedestrian access route. So the objective of a curb ramp is to warn pedestrians and vehicles that there's a potential conflict to provide safe areas for those pedestrians to wait until they can safely cross traffic and to allow handicapped users and strollers to get down the street level um, so that they can cross it effectively. So curb ramps are primarily governed by the Public Rights-of-Way Accessibility Guidelines, or PROAG. Chapter 3 contains most of the technical information for curb ramps. Other chapters have some additional detail. And then most states have their own application of standards. So here in Virginia, VDOT has their CG12 standard. So before we actually look at some curb ramps, I just want to cover some of the main elements. So there's the ramp itself shown in orange and the defectable warning surface at the bottom of the ramp shown in yellow. In addition, at the top or bottom of one of the ramps, you want to provide a landing slash turning space four feet by four feet or five feet if there's an obstruction like a wall that's behind it. You also want to look at where the approaches are coming in and if that approach crosses one of your supporting elements, then you need to look at providing a wing so that you don't have a drop off that would be a trip hazard as shown in the top image by providing the wing instead of a curve you don't have that drop off 
So now let's go into a case study of an improperly designed ramp. So this is a perpendicular ramp that's outside my apartment complex actually. And when you actually do the math for the ramp, it ends up having about a 16% slope. In addition, the detectable warning surface isn't quite in the appropriate location. It needs to be located at the back of curb. Here you can see the way they warp the curb. There really isn't a back of curb at all. So when you specify something like this, a contractor might do a field modification and say, okay, the typical minimum length for one of these ramps is um, eight feet from the back of curb. So if you installed that style of ramp in this situation, it would look pretty good, but you start to realize that there's no turning space provided at the top, it's in the grass. And if you're a wheelchair user coming out across the sidewalk, your pedestrian access route has been violated because the cross slope is now about 8.3% instead of 2%. And it could be very difficult to navigate a wheelchair with that much cross slope up and down those wings. So you can put a perpendicular ramp out here. It is possible. And to do so, you would have to actually add a sidewalk behind the ramp itself to maintain the four foot pedestrian access route and provide that turning space. But this still has a disadvantage in that at the bottom of the ramp, the, uh, you need a turning space and it can be very difficult to maintain the slope criteria in that area so that a wheelchair user who gets to the bottom can turn themselves to go either way down the street. This is one of the reasons why VDOT is really not fond of these ramps. Um, they will not allow them typically in their right of way, even in retrofit scenarios. So one of the more common retrofits you'll see that is permissible is a type B ramp or a parallel ramp. This one maintains a pedestrian access route without any additional right of way by ramping down along the sidewalk and providing a flat landing in the middle. And that helps because a wheelchair user can reorient themselves in that flat landing and then head along the street there's still a little bit of um, directionality that they have to change, but it is superior. This ramp still isn't the best ramp though. So it doesn't directionalize pedestrians. So if you're visually impaired, it doesn't really help you head in the direction you need to head. It actually sends you out into the intersection. The other thing is that there are no receiving curb ramps. Uh, the right image is the actual aerial view of this ramp. And as you can see, it's a ramp to nowhere. So, that means it's not particularly helpful because it doesn't really go anywhere. It can help you access the parked car along the street, but not much else. So the ideal curb ramp configuration is to try to split and directionalize the ramps. And so you can see these are some of VDOT's recommendations on some very idealized corners. Um, and you want to have one ramp for each direction. And then you want the ramps to point as shown in say the bottom right image in the ideal direction so that you can keep blind pedestrians directed along the pedestrian access route. So there are two different philosophies that I've seen and that really take hold um, for design of curb ramps. One is to keep the curb ramps as perpendicular as possible and this reduces the crossing distances and times but as you can see at a skewed intersection like this one it can significantly offset how far a pedestrian has to walk to actually get to their destination. And so you start running into uh, sight distance issues in terms of when you move the um, crosswalks this far back, you have to move the stop bars back. And you also start looking at a uh, lack of compliance. You'll have a higher chance of able-bodied pedestrians just walking and not using the curb ramp or the street. And sometimes they won't even push the press buttons. So that's one of the difficulties. The other philosophy is that you can try to maintain the natural pedestrian access route and add a little bit of angle to the crossings. So the crossings are a few feet longer, which doesn't do that much in terms of pedestrian crossing times. It does make it a little harder to directionalize blind pedestrians, but it doesn't run into the same sight distance issues. And it can feel a little bit more, more natural to your users. So that's just talking about sidewalk curb ramps, but I also want to just mention some things for VDOT shared use paths. So with VDOT shared use paths, um, if you have a shoulder and ditch section, you still need to put in a detectable warning surface and that detectable warning surface needs to be in a concrete collar. If you have a curb and gutter section, then you need to add a proper ramp in per PROAG. 
that ramp should always be made of concrete per VDOT. Now at a locality level, I'm sure you can do something different. And th the other requirement is that the curb ramp should be at least as wide as the facility it connects to. Otherwise it can't function properly. If you have bicycles coming both ways and the curb ramp isn't the full width of the facility, then you can start to run into additional conflicts. So in summation, you want to try to follow the uh, PROAG guidelines while maintaining the PAR, not putting any kind of obstacles in the way, such as a utility pole. Um, and you want to make sure that you separate and directionalize pedestrians wherever possible. Thank you. And here to do the next section is Ben Duran for designing the right crossing. Thank you, Kyle. Once you've gotten pedestrians safely to uh, the edge of the travelway with your ideal cross, uh, uh, your ideal uh, ramps, we need to design the right crossing. So in order to, to put in a marked crosswalk at an unsignalized uh, intersection, VDOT requires that a pedestrian crossing study is performed. Um, in their INIMTE uh, 384, this attachment D kind of walks you th through what a sample pedestrian crossing study might look like. Uh, you walk through certain things like road configuration, number of pedestrians, vehicles, speed, all those different items. Moving further in that INIM, there are several different flow charts that you can walk through. The first flow chart walks you through making the decision point on stop or yield controlled intersections. The second chart walks you through uncontrolled approaches. And then that last flow chart kind of walks you through looking at different types of markings and when you should go with transverse lines or high visibility crosswalks. And we can dive into more detail uh, moving forward. Um, in this INIM is a very helpful decision chart that you can look at. On the left, you can see there is the roadway configuration. So are we looking at a, um, five lane highway divided with a mark median? Are we looking at three lane road? What's the road configuration that pedestrians are crossing? Next, we look at vehicle uh, traffic. Are we having um, 50, 60, 70,000 cars per day crossing our roads like that image on the left? Or are we crossing a pretty lonesome abandoned stretch of roadway where vehicular traffic's not really a big hindrance? And then finally, we're looking at the speed of oncoming vehicles so that um, pedestrians have enough decision-making time to cross the road safely. And as well, those oncoming cars um, have enough stopping sight distance. So are we crossing a 25 mile an hour roadway or a 55 mile an hour roadway? So taking all these things together, we kind of walk through a case, uh, for example, a two lane roadway at 45 mile an hour with 10,000 vehicles per day. You kind of move across and you look at being in condition B. Well, what is condition B? Well, c condition B is a potential candidate for marked crosswalk, and you should be looking at putting in a high visibility crosswalk. Well, the different types of uh, striped patterns that you can use, uh, the far left are transverse lines. That's considered standard striping. And then those next four are considered high visibility. You have longitudinal, sometimes uh, referred to as continental, bar pairs. Then the last two aren't necessarily used per VDOT, but sometimes striped in different localities. They're ladder and zebra um, markings. So once we decide what type of marking uh, is appropriate, we need to bear in mind where this crosswalk should be located, specifically um, adjacent to star bars. You need to have a four foot minimum space to keep the pedestrians safely buffered from stop vehicles. And these crosswalks need to be a minimum of six feet in width. Other types of uh, crossing treatments we'd look at are regulatory and warning signs like these two shown here on the left, that's a school crossing warning sign. And on the right, a pedestrian crossing warning sign. And per the Virginia MUTCD, these signs need to be a fluorescent background to make them more visible. Um, another type of crossing treatment we might look at would be rectangular rapid flashing beacons, RRFBs as shown here. Uh, they light up and flash and really call attention to pedestrians about to cross the road. 
And um, in order to put these in, we kind of need to look at whether or not they're warranted. And these charts help you walk through it. On the bottom, we're looking at vehicles per hour and on the side, pedestrians per hour. And you kind of walk through and see, all right, depending on my length of crossing, that's what those four different colored lines are. Depending on that length of crossing is an RRFB warranted. Now, if our plotted point of vehicles per hour and pedestrians per hour is above those colored lines, we have to look at moving towards signalized crossings. And here to talk about that is Andrew Smith. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, signalizing pedestrian crossings. Uh, there's two types of signalized pedestrian crossings you're mainly going to be dealing with. Uh, the first one you see on your left is more of a traditional signal where you have vehicle traffic uh, being controlled in different directions as well as your pedestrians. And then on the right there is kind of a newcomer to the game. It's called a hawk signal or a high intensity activated crosswalk beacon. Uh, these are typically not located at intersections. In fact, the MUTCD prefers them to be located at mid-block crossings uh, as their signal indications make it a little more difficult to control both mainline traffic and side street traffic. So a hawk signal, what is it? How does it work? Well, the MUTCD has a nice little diagram here kind of showing how the hawk signal works. Uh, typically, it does not display a signal face until, or a signal indication until it is activated by a pedestrian push button in which case it'll been, then kind of act like a traditional signal of telling you to slow down and come to a stop. Uh, when you come to a stop, that'll allow pedestrians uh, safe time to cross the intersection. Uh, after a certain amount of time, the signal will then go into a flashing mode, which will allow cars to begin slowly uh, and safely clearing the intersection one at a time. And then once the pedestrian interval has finished, the flashing beacons will end and the signal will go back dark and vehicle traffic will return to normal. So how do you determine uh, what you need to do with your pedestrian crossings and crossing timings? Well, MUTCD kind of makes it easy for us. Uh, they set the walk interval uh, recommendation is seven seconds and that's the time that they have to, to enter the intersection from the pedestrian ramp. Uh, seven seconds can be lowered on a case-by-case -case basis if pedestrian volumes are low or there's some other circumstance uh, that you're faced with on your crossing. Uh, I find that uh, lower crossing intervals can be beneficial at very low volume crossings and especially when you want to keep your side street crossing times to a minimum to uh, lessen your impact on your main line. And the countdown interval that you see uh, with the flashing hand, uh, that is dictated by the crossing speed of the pedestrian. Uh, the MUTCD recommends a three and a half feet per second crossing time for most pedestrians. So you take your crosswalk length and divide it by that time to get your crossing time. Uh, but you do need to know your users uh, to adjust that time appropriately. So if, for example, you have an intersection that has maybe a, a retirement home or a uh, home that helps with a lot of the dis uh, disabled, uh, you may want to slow down their crossing time and, and as a result, or slow down their speed and as a result, increase the crossing time to give them a little extra time to get across safely. This right here, just kind of an example of how you can terminate your pedestrian intervals. Uh, typically, what we see most of is the first and last option there where your flashing interval either terminates right when the uh, vehicles in the same direction see the yellow, or the flashing interval may terminate at some arbitrary time during the green interval. Uh, which would then allow right turning vehicles to have kind of a little extra time to make a right turn without worrying about uh, pedestrians being there. Uh, the three options in the middle are kind of a case by case if you need them. A uh, second one I'm particularly not a fan of as it suggests a less than three second yellow time, which uh, I do not believe is safe operations. But you, you may have a situation in your jurisdiction where one of those options in the middle will be more appropriate. And uh, lastly, we'll talk about how do, you, how do you take bikes into consideration at traffic signals? Well, the first main uh, op, uh, point is detection. So if you have a shared use path, bicycles will more than likely be uh, needing like a push button or something like that because pedestrians will already have one for their pedestrian crossing. So bicyclists can just use the push button and cross using that. Now, if you have things like bike lanes or bike boxes, then you have to start looking into actual true detection me measures. Uh, and two of those options can either be cameras or, and that can be you know, either a video camera or 
a like an infrared camera or you would have to put loops in the pavement and then give bicyclists a marker on the pavement to tell them where they can sit in order to change a signal. Uh, now the loops are a little bit different than your traditional traffic loop. They're smaller, but they have to be wrapped more because bikes are, excuse me, bikes are not as big as cars. And so they don't have, they don't generate quite the electromagnetic field disturbance that is needed to trigger the light compared to a car sitting over top of those loops. And once you get the bike detected, then you got to figure how you're going to get them through the intersection safely. Um, the bicyclists, you need to take into account their approach speed when you come, when, when they're, when you're factoring in your red and yellow intervals. If you're just using your tip of your standard traffic signals to control the bicyclist, then you need to, when you're developing the yellow and red times, take into account that a bike speed is somewhere probably in the range of maybe 12 miles an hour upwards to 15 or 16. And that'll mostly impact your red clearance interval as the yellow interval is more to get vehicle stop, bikes can stop pretty easily. But the red clearance interval is how you can get that bike out of the intersection safely without any cross traffic coming at them. And so with their reduced speed, you're gonna be increasing your red interval. Uh, one way around this is to install actual bicycle signals as you can see there on the right and then bicyclists can have their own clearance time. Uh, the catch on this currently now in Virginia is that the bicycle signal is a FHWA interim approval. And right now, neither VDOT nor any localities in the state of Virginia have approval to use this. That's not to say you can't write the FHWA and ask for it, and they would probably be more than willing to give you the approval to do it, but just don't start going out there and putting these signals up um, on your own without getting the approvals first. Um, and, and as far as timings go, uh, a lot of time, uh, a lot of jurisdictions are starting to incorporate them into their uh, vehicle timings as well. So if, if it's something that you haven't started thinking about yet with your signals, it is definitely something moving forward to take into consideration. And now I'm going to turn it over to Thomas Ruff, who's going to talk about utilizing existing facilities and uh, the existing right of way. Thanks, Andrew. So uh, our next topic here, the last topic, is repurposing the existing right of way. And uh, we've got a lot of pavement in all of our localities in the state of Virginia and trying to find uh, the best ways to repurpose that right away, make it a better functional public space and use it not just in traditional ways, but try to recover it to make uh, the travel way comfortable and safe for all roadway users. So there's a couple of different techniques we're going to go through. Um, the first technique is uh, what's called lane narrowing. And so this can be used to, uh, you can see in this, this diagram, you can do it. Lane narrowing really serves the purpose of making vehicles feel more constrained and try and, and lowering the speeds of that through vehicle. You know, FHWA says lane narrowing can reduce vehicle speeds between one and three miles per hour. And uh, you, get, you can do this in a number of ways, whether by re installing a new parking lane, uh, installing a new bike lane or just in taking in those through travel lanes, right? There a lot of times can be, you know, 12 feet or larger if you're on a residential street that's 30 feet wide, you know, that's a wide as expanse of asphalt and bringing that in and narrowing the lanes will help to lower speeds and maybe make a case for putting in something a little more multimodal. Um, so in the case, um, go ahead, Nick. Um, and this is uh, one example. Uh, this is a five lane section on Route 10. And through this, it was a, you know, all of the lanes were 12 feet wide with a 16 foot two way left turn lane. So we've got 64 feet of pavement. Um, by going in and reducing the through lanes to 10 and a half feet um, and the two way left turn lane to 14 feet, we're able to recover eight feet of pavement. So that allowed a four foot bike lane to be installed on either side. Um, this was a 35 mile an hour roadway, um, but it was through uh, an area that, that wanted to experience a little more bike facilities. There wasn't the right of way to install uh, a shared use path outside of the, the curb and gutter. Um, and so this was a good way to repurpose that roadway um, to install uh, a bike lane. Um, another opportunity, and this is a little more for the urban folks that uh, in an area where you may have some on-street parking is to start you know, delineating your parking with uh, either pavement marking lines or in this case in this photo we're showing uh, a uh, kind of a concrete change, something that will delineate the through traffic from the parking traffic. 
as well as you can see in the background of this photo, um, you know, trying to find ways to put curb bump outs or curb extensions that will uh, lock in the parking area and designate where the parking area is and keep the through vehicles again from, from interacting with those park vehicles, which will slow vehicles down. Now to further go into those curb extensions, this is a good little diagram that shows, um, uh, again, this is, this is definitely for a more urban setting where you have uh, on-street parking, but you can think about it in locations where maybe you have a wide shoulder and at the intersection, you decide you determine that you want to bring the, uh, the the shoulder in so that you can narrow the crossing for pedestrians, which is important, but also so you give a, a better vantage point for both the, the pedestrian and the car to see one another. Um, and so this is just a good example of how that can work and how we can you can also move your signage into that that smaller crosswalk um, or into that curb extension and uh, just get a better outcome for all parties. Now in this photo, it shows it a little bit, um, you know, as one continuous piece, but there are many examples of curb extensions and curb bump outs being located in areas that already have uh, a curb and gutter, and you would put it into the asphalt to reclaim some of that asphalt, and you can maintain your existing drainage. So, um, you know, a lot of uh, more constrained areas and co constrained costs would want to make sure we keep our existing drainage as best we can. This is one of those ways to avoid having to fully replace all of your drainage. Um, one good example of this, and, and, and one thing we touted in it is a, a, what's called a bike boulevard. And that was a project, it, this is a project from the city of Richmond. And uh, you can see there's a combination of traffic circles, curb extensions, there were uh, shero pavement markings, um, some other traffic calming techniques and a lowering of the speed limit. And the goal here in calling it a bike boulevard and doing all of those uh, traffic calming items was to encourage more bikers onto the roadway and to make the vehicle, vehicular traffic feel, feel like they weren't supposed to be there. Um, the, the street is still open to, to, to vehicles, but you get a snowball effect of more bikers are on the street and uh, less vehicles feel comfortable being there. And that in turn brings out more, more folks to bike. And so you have a continuous snowball of bringing more and more bikes into a single, singular area. And that was the goal and, and the accomplished goal of this project. And so the last technique I'm gonna talk about are uh, road diets. So a road diet essentially is taking any uh, four, five, six lane roadway and removing travel lanes or repurposing those travel lanes. Um, generally, we're talking about locations that are undivided, uh, so don't have a median, but they can be any, any road that has a large amount of pavement. And a road diet takes away those lanes, and by doing so, it takes away at least one lane. Um, you can do, like on, the, on this photo, turn a through lane into a bike lane, you could remove the, you know, remove a through lane and install a median. Um, you could potentially move the curbs in to take away a lane and put your shared use path or sidewalk at the back of the curb and gutter. Um, but all those effects essentially will help reduce your travel speeds. Um, so the FHWA and VDOT have seen uh, reductions between four and seven miles per hour in, in roadway speeds. And so with reduced speeds, you get reduced crash severity. and uh, and that's not just car to car, but also your car to bike or car to pedestrian. Um, you reduce your crossing distance for the bikes and the pedestrians, and you also reduce your left turn crossing distance and left, tur left turn conflict areas uh, for any vehicles on the roadway. So the FHWA and, and would tell you that anything, you know, a two lane roadway can handle, you know, in that area of 20,000 vehicles a day. And so, a, any road that has any four, five, or six lane roadway that has more than, uh, you know, it has well more than, uh, or less than 20,000 vehicles a day is a good candidate to say, do we need this road? So if, you, if you've got uh, one thing to start looking at in your locality is do you have any large sections of, uh, of, of pavement, uh, roads that have less than 15,000 vehicles a day, and there isn't really any development potential in that area, 
or it's already a built out mature corridor. And you wanna think about how can we convert that? So that's, that's your first kind of takeaway here is to look for those, uh, lo those roadways that have, don't have a lot of traffic, but have a lot of pavement. Um, and one example of this, a, a success story is, uh, and I can walk through kind of some of the different, how we got to this operational point is, uh, this is Turner Road in Chesterfield County. Um, you can see from this photo, this was taken in the fall. It's a five lane section, uh, two through lanes in each direction and a two way left turn lane. Uh, and it's about a two mile stretch that travels from uh, Route 60 Midlothian Turnpike to US 360 Pole Street and uh, further down to Walmsley. And uh, the tra we, we went back and started looking at the traffic volumes uh, for this project. And so you can see we, the original plans when this was widened from two to four lanes were in 1983, uh, quite, a, quite a while ago. So in 1983, the, the generally the traffic volumes were around 14 to 15,000 vehicles a day. Uh, in the next, over the next 10 years, VDOT had projected uh, that the traffic volumes would increase to around 19,000 vehicles per day. Uh, we don't have any good data um, for traffic data between in the late 80s and 90s, but um, you know, publicly available VDOT data from 2001 until 2019 uh, showed that really, you know, there may have been a spike in the 90s, but really the traffic volumes have stayed around 14,000 vehicles or less per day, per day um, over the last 20 years. So that's that was one of our key signs in saying, hey, you know, we're not seeing anything. This this is a mature corridor traffic volumes aren't just rising at 1% per year, 2% per year, they're staying flat and potentially even lower and dropping. And so with that information, we were able to, and that's another takeaway there is, is that publicly available VDOT data, um, it's on the VDOT website and you can go back and look at 20 years of your traffic data now and, uh, and start looking at those roadway, your roadways um, in, in trying to find a way to reuse the road uh, and, and here's just a few more photos from what we did with Turner Road. It was, uh, as you can see, the five lane section. We were able to uh, remove the two, two of the three lanes, uh, install a buffer, a bike lane and a buffer area for that bike lane, as well as uh, some turn lane improvements along the corridor. And you can see we, we you know, this was, uh, this was the preferred option because uh, Turner Road was a bikeway for Chesterfield County, and so that was the route we took, but it, we could have pulled the curbs in and installed, like I said, a shared East path or sidewalk or some other iteration. But at the end of the day, um, we were able to come to a good solution on performing this road diet. So that will wrap up my section, and I'm gonna kick it back over to Nick and wrap it up. Thanks, Thomas. <clears throat> so to wrap up, just um, six key takeaways here from each of these sections. First. Uh, identify your users and the goals for the project to ensure success. Recognize current and future uses. Respect ProWag and the pedestrian access route. Design the right crossing. Understand and select the different types of signalization. And consider new ways to use old pavement. So with those takeaways, we want to save a few minutes here for questions. If we have any, our contact information is here. And Sarah, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Nick. While we're waiting um, to see if anybody has any questions, I just want a quick reminder that um, we will be sending out certificates of completion for any self-reporting PDH um, hours that you may have. So um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A um, box at the bottom of your screen. Um, if not, we appreciate your time uh, today and thanks everyone for your content um, for speaking today and um, everyone have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Looks like we do have one question here. Oh. Um, yes, we will be post um, posting this online. If you'd like a link, feel free to reach out to us um, personally to any of these um, speakers to see if you'd like a um, recording of this video.
Um, thank you everyone and have a great rest of the day. I think that's it. If anyone is on here um, and you do want to receive uh, a recording, you can check out our YouTube channel, um, searching Timmons Group, and we will be posting them on that channel as well.